All right, welcome back everybody to Prescribing Truth. I'm Jamal Bandy. If this is your first time watching, please remember to hit that subscribe button if you find this content helpful and hit that um, notification bell to the side so then you can be notified when I have new content. If you're listening to this on various podcast apps, please remember to comment, to leave a uh, type of review, let me know what you think about the show or whatnot. If you like it, don't like it and whatnot, all uh, criticism is pretty good if it's helpful. Um, if you want to contact me, you can do so by emailing me at prescribed.truth at gmail.com or calling me at 801-980-6333. If you'd like to support the show financially, you can do so by partnering with me on Patreon. The link is showing as it's scrolling across the screen. It's also in the description at patreon.com forward slash prescribed truth. We have different rewards here. It's anywhere from a dollar and up. Um, you take part of the post show and the pre-show and, uh, yeah, you know, all that kind of good stuff. I had a good time today. On the pre-show with Patreon, uh, Ivan joined me and we had a, a good time looking at some old clips. It was pretty cool, pretty dope. I like that. Uh, for the $5 up patrons, I have your gospel tracks um, getting ready to get in the mail and get shipped out to you. So that be that you will have them um, this month. So uh, be looking out for that. Um, today's show, I don't want to be long. I know I always say that sometimes and it still goes long, but we're going to work on that tonight. I want to do a review slash give my thoughts on a blog that was given by uh edwin ramirez from the proverbial life he is over the proverbial life and uh this is an article that he wrote i'm um, dealing with the woke church 10 reasons why it will ultimately fail in its mission now i'm gonna come off the whim and come off the top and say man i, I agree with this article i agree with it and the reason why i decided i want to do a review of it because i had a guy um, ask me uh, for a reason why I agree with these points that um, Edwin made. And um, I was like, well, if he asked that question, I wonder if somebody else is thinking that. So why don't I do a video giving my thoughts on it? And um, even my nuanced views, whatever the case may be. And so um, I'm hopefully I sent Edwin a, a copy of this link to this channel for this live. So I'm hoping he get a chance to look at it. If not, he'll look at the replay. But um, yeah, this is going to be a pretty straightforward review. Because like I said, I agree with it. But um, I still want to just give my thoughts as, as I go through it, all right? And you can comment your thoughts. Let me know what you think about it and so on and so forth. Um, I will put a link to his um, page, the blog page, in my description so you can check it out for yourself and see what other articles he's written. He has a lot of content on there. Please go check it out and support this brother. Um, good Christian brother, man. All right, and a close friend of mine. All right, so... I'm not going to hold you long for that. Let's let's jump right into it. I think that's the best way to do it. All right, let's get to it. Let me um change to the screen here. All right, so this is what his page looks like when you come on uh, for the link. And uh, matter of fact, I'm going to go ahead and take this link and copy it into the description right now. Do that right now. So in case anybody comes on. They can just click on the link for themselves. All right, so that's done. All right, now, so, like I said, just going to briefly just go through uh, my thoughts on this. And we're going to start from the top. I don't know what I just did. Just clicked on it again. All right. The Upside Down Church. Ten reasons why the woke church movement will ultimately fail in its mission. Now, starting off right here. I think it's a very good opener. Um, gets you kind of engaged. You want to know what are these reasons that's going to fail. Now, if you're on the other side of this and you are like, man, no, the woke church is going to prevail. It's going to, it's going to sustain. It's going to be sustained. It's going to be successful and so on and so forth. Well, you probably already got upset by looking at the title here, and that's understandable. Um, but, you know, even though somebody may disagree with you, it's good to see what points they make to see what, you know, what they're saying and can you engage with it? Can you interact with it? Um, are they making valid points or just kind of blowing hot air? That's what you kind of want to look at. You don't want to just dismiss somebody off top just because you disagree with them, you know. So the Upside Down Church, I like the graphic. Very telling, just like, and it's, and it's really, <laughs> this is really kind of how everything has been lately. Things are kind of flipped on his head. It's like, man, like, it's like, the, it's, it's just like, <laughs> it's just what it is. Just like when you see this picture, it's flipped. Everything is flipped and it's chaotic. Like, you look at this picture, it doesn't look right. You know, this church looks out of place. And exactly how this movement is, it's, it's out of place. You know, um, 
You know, you may have good intentions. You may stand behind this with good intentions and so on and so forth. But it is so out of place. All right. So let's go back and let's go on to the first point. I think you can see that okay. You can let me know in the comments if you can't see that well. Um, let's just let me know. All right. But so the very first point, the woke church movement will ultimately fail in its mission because it undermines the gospel's application of justification by faith alone. Now, I'm going to read what he has here. I'm going to read all of what he has said. I'm going to give my thoughts on it. Fair enough? All right. He said, if you're white, this is here. If you're white, then you have privilege. And if you have privilege but refuse to acknowledge and it renounce it, then you are branded as an enemy to the woke church. It, it isn't enough that you have been justified by faith alone, in Christ alone. The woke church gatekeepers are unified in their stance. In order to be in right standing with God, you need to be woke again, not only born again. I thought it was good. Now, let me let me give my thoughts on this breakdown here. So the very first point, just in what's in the bold, the woke church will ultimately fail in this mission because it undermines the gospel's application of justification. By faith alone. This is because you have brothers. You have people who are Christians saying that other Christians may not be saved because of their disagreements concerning what is considered racial injustices. This is all what this is about. The, the disagreement, and I've done videos on this. The disagreement is based on what we consider to be just and unjust. What is racial injustice and what isn't? And what is some things that are considered racial injustices aren't. And if you say they aren't, then you're counted off. And then for its privilege goes, you're saying this is an injustice because you you know have white people who have privilege. So this is a, this is an injustice. All right. So if you're white, you get more, you can get better. And while we over here, we you know we little black people over here can't get much, can't can't do nothing. That's the the stance. And if you disagree with that. And if you refuse to acknowledge that it exists, then you're branded as an enemy. I mean, you have people who have cut brothers off, like straight blocked them, like Christian brothers blocked them. You know, no, no communication, no contact, no conversation. And, and, they, and you, and you think that's okay. They undermine like this. If we're brothers in Christ, then we should be able to come together, you know, discuss things and things that are controversial in case may be. It should not be above what the gospel is to us, what brings us together. But it has become that way. Then the last part, the woke church gatekeepers are unified in their stance. And I love how you put gatekeepers because this is what it is. It's like these people are at the gate and they're the ones who say you have right of passage. Like, okay, do you pass the test? Are you woke enough? Um, do you, announce, do you uh, acknowledge your white privilege? Do you renounce that privilege? You know, that now we can let you in the gate. It's open for you now. You know, and that's and that's how it is. And if you and if you don't acknowledge it and if you don't agree with well, then it's closed and you're blocked. You know, now there are some nuances here. There are brothers who are willing to talk and so on and so forth. But the language here is dealing with most, not all. You know what I'm saying? But see, somebody will say, Well, this is not me. Like I don't undermine the gospel's application of justification. I don't necessarily feel this way. As he's saying here, you got to acknowledge, you got to acknowledge just like on the other side, how they branding everybody with trying to be so conservative and more concerned with their political stances versus the truth of injustices. You know, saying like you have to be you have to like don't have double standards here. If you're going to group everybody and say, well, most of y'all try to hold to your conservatism, then you can't be mad when a brother puts most of y'all in the camp that does this. Because this is what's happening. That's what's happening. All right? So this is, I stand with that. That's true. This is true. Okay, Doug. Yeah, man. Yeah. Oh, man. I, I had to get off of it, man. Like, even, like, I'm glad the conversation that I had on there was, was, was pretty cool. Okay. You know what I'm saying? But it's like, the guy never responded back. You know? He asked, he asked my reasons why. I um I think the woke church movement is dangerous, but he never came, you know, gave a response back to what I said. But um now this conversation is coming from from somebody else who basically saw the post that I posted on my page when I shared this article. 
and they want to know my thoughts. Yeah, man, this and like this is divisive. It's divisive. This is not the way Christ didn't die on the cross for us to be divided over stuff like this. Stuff like this. And it's and it's and it'd be a different thing if it was actually going on, but it's a it's based on a premise that's false. And that's where it all comes from. All right, so the point, the second point, going to this next one. And I like how he included some examples here. So the point two, the woke church movement will ultimately fail in its mission because it undermines the role of sanctification in the believer's life. I'm like, without reading the rest, I'm like, yes, yes. Because they assume if you don't agree and if you just happen to have this privilege and this this racist, racism in you, well, you just, there's no room for sanctification. It's like, if it, if it ain't, if you're not rid of it right now, then obviously you're not a believer and you're not going to get it. And we need to cut ties with you, cut fellowship with you. There's no room for the Holy Spirit's work in your heart concerning these things. Not now. Like you, you should have had that before, but if you ain't got it now, then we're going to cut you off. And that's what's been happening. You got brothers saying, now, he didn't put it in this article, but you got brothers when, when Trump was elected. Christian brothers saying they don't feel safe to worship with other white brothers and sisters because of a president that got elected. What? You got brothers and sisters saying, hey, we need to have we need to have um, a, like safe spaces for our people. We need to do something with just us and not the white people. Like we don't like, don't invite the whites. Let's do something with just us black people. Like you think, man, I wonder. I wonder if Martin Luther King, if he was alive today, because they, they like to pull on Martin Luther King and his quotes. I wonder if he was alive today, would he agree with that? Like, would he agree with that? Did he go through all of that trouble just for you to get back segregated again? Just for that? And let alone in the church? No, man. Because even during that time, even during that time of segregation, you had true Christians who weren't trying to be segregated from blacks. That were they existed. They were shunned. They were they were people who were put off, and the other white other white people didn't like them because they were trying to be friends with the blacks and so on and so forth. You had you had all those stuff going on. There were Christians who knew the word and tried their best to follow the word, man. So this role of sanctification is powerful, man, because that's the work of the Spirit. All of us got sin that we deal with, and so racism being a sin is something that the Holy Spirit is powerful enough to sanctify a believer through if he's dealing with it. Or he or she is dealing with it, you know, but if a person is not dealing with it, you can't make them deal with it because they have a different skin color than you. And that's what we're seeing. Like, you got to admit that you've had some kind of racism in you because you've had this privilege and so on and so forth. Then you have these white brothers and sisters like coming out the woodwork. Well, they've never said anything racist, but all of a sudden, well, you know, I, I might've had some racist thoughts here and there. And, and, um, you know, now that I think about it, I, you know, I may have could have been racist. It's like they're having to force themselves to be, to admit to something that may not even happen, that they weren't even thinking about. You know, apologizing for sins that they didn't, they didn't commit. This is crazy. So, now, I, I just went on a tangent just by the, the bold. So, let's get into this, this block under here. Aside from Jesus, no person has ever lived a perfect life. Amen. We are all a wretch in need of the grace and mercy of God. And only in Christ, by means of his spirit, is the child of God made more like Jesus in sanctification. The woke church has no sympathy. No sympathy. I highlight that because I've seen that. No sympathy, patience, or compassion for people who misspeak or who flat out disagree with their worldview. Now, this is seen when we're dealing with James White. Dr. James White goes on and there was a, he's talking about Hebrew Israelites. He was saying how Hebrew Israelites are so racist. Well, these, this particular camp was really racist. And he was saying that they were worse than the KKK. Their racism. And so he that went on a whole, I mean, that was like, that was like chum to anybody who was ready to call him a racist, ready to call him all kind of this and that and the third, you know. But he even came back on this program and he said, he gave understanding to or clarification to what he was saying. He said it. Now, either you can call the man a liar, say he's trying to say this to say face what the case may be. You, you, that's, I mean, that's the only way you can do with that, try to call him a liar. But he came back and he said, hey, 
I'm not talking about the KKK who was stringing up, stringing up blacks and lynching blacks and so on and so forth. I'm talking about the ones that exist today because the ones that exist today are still racist. There are KKK members today who are still racist, yet they're not stringing up black people. They're not, you know, uh, burning uh, stakes and crosses and stuff like that. They're not doing all that stuff. They're just having their meetings and dealing with their racism amongst themselves and, and trying to think of how they're going to influence the world, take it over, I guess. But they're not doing what they used to do. So he was, he was, that's what he was referring to. Now, you got to take the man of what he say. I mean, because as a believer, what we're supposed to do? A believer is supposed to hope all things for one another. I'm not supposed to think the worst of my brother. You know what I'm saying? I'm wanting to think the best, for, the best of my brother because he's a brother in Christ, born again, blood bought. You know what I'm saying? So there's no sympathy for anybody who misspeaks. If you misspoke and you just said the wrong thing, oh, man, you might as well hang it up because it's all they're going to remember. And to this day, though James White made that, uh, that podcast, look, was it like a week after, a week or two after that? People still think, people still hold that against them. You know, that's not, that's not being honest because we want nobody to do that to us, but that's how it was done. So, yes, that's exactly what happens. So if you cross the woke church once, saying something they deem to be offensive, there is no room for love to cover a multitude of sins. I believe that's biblical, y'all. Is that what the Bible teaches that we're supposed to do even for, the, like, our brothers in the church? Someone has to pay both figuratively and literally reparations. There is a brother who's going on record saying that he would, he's actually warning people to their, their form of reparations. Hey, give to my ministry. If you want, if you want to start the process of healing and everything else, you can start by paying some, paying some offering in my church. That's what you can do. That's so wicked. That's so wicked, man. That goes against what scripture teaches concerning giving. That every man give according to what he purposed in his heart to give. You know what I'm saying? But you're talking about reparations. And then you're gen and then we're talking about generations removed from the actual events. I'm a black man myself. I'm not expecting no reparations from no government. Come on, man. But then let alone our white brothers and sisters in the church. In the church. So yes, man, it undermines the role of sanctification in the believer's life. Now he gets a quote from Kyle J. Howard. Now, I had a brother who said that he don't believe that Kyle J. Howard, you know, you know, he's a problem. He's like, you know, he's actually OK. You know, he's not the ones who he's not one of the ones who's actually trying to, you know, push this harsh stuff, you know. But no, he is. He's he's one of the main ones. And so this quote, he said, it's not healthy or dignifying for black people to have to beg white people to be valued and considered. Now, first, I want to know who's doing that. I'm like. If you have to beg any brother to be valued and be considered, then they may not be a believer, brother. And you may be doing some unbelievers. But now what do you mean by being valued? And what do you mean by being considered? What are you trying to be considered for? And what are you trying to be valued in? That's what it comes down to. Because by you being in the made in the image of God, you already have value and you should already be considered. That's what scriptures tell us. We should consider one another. More than ourselves. So in what way are you trying to be considered? That you feel like you have to beg for it? And he said it's doubly not dignifying for black Christians to have to continually do that with other Christians. I consider the denomination unhealthy for African Americans. And notice how this how tunnel minded this is. So this is only for black people, y'all. Only black people. This has nothing to do with Hispanics, Asians, anyone else. Just blacks. We're the special breed. We're the special ones. And we have to be taken care of in such a way. We're, you know, we can't, you know, we, we can't bear no more scars. You know what I'm saying? Like, we got, like, you got to consider us. You got to value us more than what you're doing. You got to now. You, you got to take care of us. You know what I'm saying? Need some things taken care of. You know, like, for real, this is what it's getting down to. Like, who's doing this? Is somebody, if nobody's valuing you as a human being, then you're in the wrong place, period. Period. If you're not being valued as a human being, then you're in the wrong place. Period. Period. But I guarantee you that that's not the case coming from the church. Not the case. I digress. Ver I'm about to say verse three. <laughs> the woke church, number three. The woke church movement will ultimately fail in its mission because it seeks to destroy the unity that Christ already accomplished. Now, this is my biggest point that 
uh, that grieves my heart concerning all of this is going on. Ever since this stuff started going on and, and coming out into the main, uh, you know, main avenues and so on and so forth, it's just like just division, 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 division. And it's like, man, like we're supposed to be unified in the faith, one faith, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, coming together as one to to preach and proclaim this gospel, this good news of salvation to this lost and dying world. And we can't do that together because we're worried about things like people not getting loans on equal scales. Yes, because people aren't getting loans on equal scales. Now you say, Jamal, where are you getting that from? Dr. Mason said that in an interview, recent interview on the Jude 3 Project, he felt like that's an injustice. That's an example of racial injustice because, you know, blacks aren't earning on the same levels. Therefore, they, they, they should, they're they not getting the, they not getting the loans like somebody else is getting and so on and so forth. This is a racial injustice. And you don't agree with that, but you push it for um, going, going against abortion, then you are unequal in your pursuit of justice. You know, that's, that's his idea of this. This is where disconnect call, you know, comes in. And then he says, well, if you disagree with me, I don't even want to talk about it. No, I don't want to talk with you about it if you disagree. I'm only willing to talk to people who agree with me or who's maybe on a fence about it, but you're leaning toward that way. Like, But if, you're, if you disagree, there ain't no need of us to talk. What about the unity? What about being unified in Christ? In Christ. I mean, especially when you have brothers saying they don't want to fellowship with other white Christians. Now, like, I'm leaving my church because they don't view these things like I do. So I'm going to leave this church and go find me a predominantly black church to go worship in. Really? Out of all the things to separate from your church for, that is what you're going to separate? Because they don't see things like you see it? You can't have a conversation? You can't agree, disagree? There are so many things that are so much bigger than that. But, you know, that's, that's, that's the case. So it says the word of God is clear. In Christ, we are one. Romans 12, 5. However, for some reason, the woke church seems to have selective memory when it comes to this foundational truth. Their social media virtue signaling and grandstanding prove that they would rather please the world than to believe what the Bible says concerning our unity in Christ. I think that just says it all. It says it all. So far, so good. I don't see anything wrong with the wording. I don't, I don't see anything wrong with this. Like, you know, you might say, well, that's not me. Like I said, you may say, well, I'm not in that. You know, I'm not in that camp. I, believe, I agree with that, too. Okay, good. That's what's up. Number four, the woke church movement will ultimately fail in its mission because there is no end game. Now, th to me, I think this is like one of the dead ends of this whole thing. No end game. I remember when I was on the fence um, about this whole situation. And I asked a brother who was standing on the social justice side. Well, he's still standing on the social justice side. But I asked him, what is, what, like, he was like, the, um, he said, um, ethnicities aren't represented equally in the church. You know, like, that we're, it's, it's not fair, you know. It's, it's um, predominantly white. It's being run, you know, by all this stuff. Like, it's not, you know, it's not equal amongst the ethnicities. And I asked him, I said, well, what would that look like in a general service? How would that, how would you go about a service and incorporate all that? How would that work? Tommy couldn't tell me. Now, I know some people who've taken on in their worship services, um, different forms of music and so on and so forth, but our worship services are more, much more than just music. Much, much more than music. You know, it's because you have different preaching styles and so on and so forth, what the case may be. You know, what is making it, what, what would it look like to incorporate every ethnicity in your church service. So you got a Hispanic person in your church, you got a black person in your church, you got a white person in your church, you got an Asian person in your church. How do you incorporate all of those ethnicities in a church service and make sure everybody's represented equally? How would you do that? How, what does that look like? Is it isn't something that the Bible calls us to do. You know what I'm saying? But there's no end game into all that. No end game. You know what I'm saying? It just just rah 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 rhetoric 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 with nothing in sight in the in the long run. And the reason why this wasn't the case in the civil rights movement because during the civil rights era, there was actually laws in place that kept blacks from doing certain things. Even after slavery, post-slavery, anti-literacy laws where you couldn't read, you couldn't write, and you, there was actually laws against white people for teaching you to do that. Like, yes, like, so there was an end game in sight. And guess what? We met that end game because those laws were abolished. They were done away with. That end game was met. Now, what is it today? You're dealing with heart issues. There's no end game there because you're not the controller of hearts and neither are we. You know what I'm saying? And so, with that being said, the only one who's able to turn a person's hearts from being racist into not being racist 
is God. And how do we do that? How do we how do we proclaim a message to get someone to see how their racism is sin and so on and so forth? Through the gospel. So we so we go back to the gospel. And 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 you can live that practically, but you proclaim it absolutely. Right? But other than that, there's no end game. So you protest, protest, protest. Then what? You Facebook post, Facebook post, Facebook post. Then what? Conference, conference, conference. Then what? Keep saying the same thing over and over again. That's all that happens. So it says the woke church has no idea what they are aiming at. And because of that, it will never succeed. Other than stirring the pot and making white people feel guilty for their supposed privilege and financially aiding the grievance industry, the woke church will never succeed in its mission because it doesn't have a God glorifying end in mind. Now you may, and now somebody on the other side may say, yes, no, 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 we do have a, glor- a God glorifying end in mind. We're seeking true unity. I believe we already had that. I believe before all this stuff started coming up, before all this stuff in the world started happening and we in the church started getting our minds off of Christ and onto the world, onto their culture, I believe we had that. I mean, you had blacks worshiping with whites, no problem. What, because you happen to sing, sing uh, songs and have to sing from the Psalters and you, you call it assimilating or whatever the case may be? Like, that's that wasn't harmony? You know, that wasn't loving? That wasn't unified? You know, you have blacks and whites going, sharing the gospel in the streets together, so on and so forth. You still got that going on. But so, what was broken that needed to be fixed so bad? Like, okay, I know people bring up the whitewash Christianity. Like, so we have these picture books. They have a white Jesus. They have white Samuel, white Paul, white every this, white white this and that. Like, you know, I'm like, we know, we know what the scriptures teach concerning what ethnicity the people in the Bible were. We know which ones are African, which one wasn't, so on and so forth, who was Jew, who wasn't. A, B, and C, Roman, so on and so forth. We see all that. We know that. Why are we so that concerned? Because what book says we know. We know we can just tell people, teach people. And I don't get that much concern when I see a picture of a white Jesus. Why? One, because we shouldn't have no images of Jesus anyway. So when somebody try to paint Jesus in their own image, well, that's just doing. They shouldn't be doing that anyway. But you got that in other cultures too. You know what I'm saying? So what are we getting at here? What are we getting at here? What God glorifying end is is there in mind? You know, I want to see that. So, uh, now this quote from Eric Mason. One of the most important things in a conversation on racial injustice in America is you can't say you are seeking reconciliation and unity with African Americans while at the same time presenting a rebuttal. That's basically just telling you to shut up. That's it. Are you, if you're giving a rebuttal because you disagree. So, basically, just shut up. That's it. Shut up. There's no we can't we can't reconcile till you shut up. And that's basically what the art that's basically what's been going on. That's what and that's literally what's been said. I've heard other brothers say that who stand who stand as champions on this issue. It's like hey, you know, unless you're willing to listen, that's that's that key word, listen. Unless you're willing to listen, ain't no need to try to reconcile. You might as well stay where you are. That ain't that that ain't love, man. That ain't what Christ died for, y'all. It's not. Point five, the woke church movement will ultimately fail in its mission because it refuses to forgive its supposed offenders. So even if there's a case where someone has committed a sin of racism or somebody who's who's just not wanting to, who can't acknowledge the fact that they have white privilege and so on and so forth, say we give you that. Say we give the fact that white privilege exists and so on and so forth. Well, you so you you have the only way you're going to forgive is they earn their forgiveness. That's it. That's the only way you're going to forgive. If they earn that forgiveness by changing something, by changing this. But that's not how our Lord did us. Like, man, like if we're in Christ, we are we are have a change. He gave us a changed heart without us changing a thing. And because of that changed heart, we now live a life glorifying and pleasing to him. But that's a work that he did, not us. We didn't wake up one day saying, you know what, God, I'm going to live for you. I, please forgive me for everything that I did. I'm going to change my ways. And then God said, you know what, son? I've been waiting for you. Now you have my spirit. Come on in. Like, no. We sitting around doing our sin, doing everything we was doing. Somebody presented the gospel to us or he rocked us through the scriptures. Either way, and his spirit came and rocked us and we couldn't. We had no choice but to change. No choice. No choice. But that's what Jesus said. He said, forgive your brothers. Your, heaven and fa- your father in heaven will forgive you. But it's like we can only forgive 
if they make it right. I see you. I see you. It says in Matthew 18, Peter asked Jesus how many times he should forgive the brother that sins against him. So this goes against somebody who may have said something wrong, who may have said something offensively, and you know, they, and they you know, they may have spoke what it can be, or maybe they was being offensive, and you know, they ask you to forgive them, and you see them do it again, you kind of give up on them. You know, typical stuff we see in scripture, typical stuff we see in life. Peter thought seven times would be more than enough, but Jesus responds to Peter's question by telling him that he needs to forgive his brother seven, 70 times seven. In other words, Christians who have been forgiven much by God are to continually forgive others who have sinned against them, especially those in the household of faith. The woke church never forgives its offenders. Now, the only way you'll get that forgiveness from them is you come out and say, hey, you know what? I've seen the light and I have been racist. I've seen the light. And I have white privilege. I've seen the light. And you're right. Those white people do have white privilege. And they are racist. That's the only way you'll come, you'll have your gain forgiveness in that right. Point six. The woke church movement will ultimately fail in this mission because it is rooted in worldly philosophy. Mm. Now I did a video on this, you know, the woke church. Um, I read the woke church book. Uh, so I'll, I'll try my best not to go too deep in this. It says, who needs the Bible when you have... All these other cool-looking toys over there. <laughs> the woke church claims that the Bible is sufficient, but argues like it's obsolete. From its practice in identity politics to its constant flirting with cultural Marxism, the woke church violates the Apostle John's admonition in 1 John 2.19, Love not the world, neither the things in the world. Then he gives this quote. It's from Timothy Cho. Even the optics of a diverse body in a Monocultural church gravely misses the mark of what Jesus' church is supposed to be. When our churches communicate a centering on white men, there is no way we can rightfully and honestly say that we are being Christ-centered. Wow. I just want to know who's doing it. I want to know who's, who's doing it. Who's making the church service all about white men? That's what I want to know. And I guess it's because you're talking about the reformers and everything else. They're not talking about the reformers because they're white and they just feel like, oh, these reformers, they were, they, were, they were such great men because they were white. They shared our skin color. No, their theology was great. It was, and it, I, I, I said it to a brother the other day. If, they, if their theology was, was poor, we wouldn't be reading them. We wouldn't be reading Martin Luther. We wouldn't be studying, we wouldn't be studying Char George Whitfield or anybody else because their theology was poor. It sucked. But that's not the case. That theology amongst that time was very needed because of all the things that was going on and all that kind of stuff, the Reformation, everything else. It was good, and it, and it fit with the scriptures already taught, not something that was new or new revelation and all that kind of stuff like that. That's what it's about. Not because they had skin color. Not, it's not because of that. And then, <laughs> so, now I mentioned this when, uh, and uh, Eric Mason, he uh, brings up, um, W.E.B. Du Bois in his um, book, Woke Church, and um, as a basis for his foundation of redeeming the word woke, which he doesn't really redeem the word. He just basically just takes this mess and he sprinkles Christ on it. He's just like, do, 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 little Christian, 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 where basically unbelievers are more woke than believers are. So in, in that sense. And so, yeah, you know, it's taken from that's an atheist, atheistic perspective of double consciousness. W.E.B. Du Bois was not a Christian. He was an atheist. And people will say, well, because he didn't have no, no churches that he can go to because they were white and it was ran by white men. Like, no, there were black churches. There were black churches back then he could have went to. And then then W.E.B. Du Bois said he didn't go to no black churches because he felt like they was, being too, they was doing too much like the white man. Because they, they were preaching what the white man preached. So I ain't going to work serve that God. Really? He, and even if he didn't go to church, he, he could have got a Bible. Read it for himself. See what the scriptures actually taught. He was an atheist. Plain and simple. Atheist. So his perspective of consciousness was atheistic. And if, we, if, we, if we're grabbing that, taking that idea of double consciousness and saying we got to have this triple consciousness, as Dr. Um, Eric Mason says, that's crap. That's, that's unbiblical. Not, not right. So, yeah, taken from it's rooted in worldly philosophy, not based on the scriptures. And like, and like he says, Though they claim that the Bible is sufficient, they argue like it's obsolete. You you go to the, you'll try to appeal to these people with the scriptures, and they say, "Well, you gotta go read this book. You gotta go read that book. You gotta read this book." Like, what does the scriptures teach about it? What does God say about justice? What does God say? What does He say? The Word is sufficient for everything, for everything. Anyway, 
Number seven, the woke church movement will ultimately fail in its mission because its heroes are unorthodox. Who needs Martin Luther, John Calvin, and Jonathan Edwards when you have Martin Luther King Jr., James Cone, and Robin D'Angelo? I'm not familiar with Robin D'Angelo, honestly. But James Cone, familiar with some of his stuff, and Martin Luther King Jr., of course. The woke church, the woke church's best heroes are some of the worst theologians. And some people, some people will be like, well, that don't matter because these people over here, they cast slaves and everything else. We're not, we can talk about sin all day long. Who had sin and who didn't have sin is everything else. The thing is, if you're a Christian, if you struggle with sin, you may still, you may still, like, if you struggle with sin, like, that's a pretty good chance if you're truly born again, you, you'll still see our Lord one day. But if you have a false God, a false gospel, then I don't care how many sins you're dealing with or how perfect your life is. You're going to bust hell wide open. Like, you know what I'm saying? You need to have the like the true gospel in, in mind. Um, these, these gentlemen didn't have that. They didn't have that. And that's unfortunate. That's unfortunate. That's nothing, that's nothing that, that I want to praise. There's nothing I want to make like it's an aha moment. That's sad. It is sad. You know what I'm saying? But that's the case. You know, so my thing is, if we don't, if we can't trust them with their theology concerning who God is and what the gospel is, even Martin Luther King not believing in the virgin birth, and people try to give this excuse like, well, he can he couldn't get accepted into the to the um to the good schools. Man, I I never been to a seminary school, never, never, and I don't even know if I will, but I've never been to one, and I know how to read the Bible and see that Jesus was born to Virgin Mary. I mean, you don't have to go to seminary school to learn that. So what what was in the Bible? He must have had a different Bible or something. Because if he had the same Bible that like everybody else had, then he then he was a pastor, a reverend. There was no excuse, no excuse for his for him to have a false gospel, no excuse. But he did, he did. You know, what I'm saying I'm not even worried about the fact that he was whether he was an adulterer or not and all that kind of stuff like that. I couldn't trust him in his worldview. The worldviews clashed. You know what I'm saying? Praise God for what God did using him in the civil rights movement and everything else. But that doesn't mean that he was perfect. That doesn't mean that he's somebody we should follow in everything. You know what I'm saying? That's that's just the case. You know, James Cone, I mean, man. Oh, man. It seemed like such a, something so so much is hate, so like so much hate rooted in that. And everything he was teaching, you know what I'm saying, like dealing on this subject. And like I said, I don't know about I don't know much about Robin Diana Joe, so I won't speak on that. But that's crazy. What up, Brother Jay? Oh, what up, Edwin? Finally joined in, man. Appreciate you, bro. I'm on voice. I'm on uh, point eight. I keep wanting to say verse. <laughs> like I'm reading the scriptures or something. Uh, oh, Nathan, what up, bro? What up? All right, so point eight. The woke church movement will ultimately fail in its mission because it keeps people feeling guilty. That's it. Like you, there's no, you can't come up for error in this. If you don't agree, if you don't agree, if you're white and you don't agree, you're, you're just there's no way coming for air. And if you do agree, then you still like it's like you're barely coming up to the surface because you're still held down and boggled down by the supposed past that you had. So if you came out and admitted, if you came out and admitted that you used to deal with some racism, now you feel like, oh, I gotta, I gotta watch it. I gotta watch it before I go overboard here. I can't be now. The white person can't be themselves. Our white persons can't be themselves because they're worried about offending you. And when they didn't even do anything, apologizing, feeling guilty for something they didn't even do, not their fault. It's crazy, man. He says, I believe it was Dr. James White who rightly said there is now, therefore, much condemnation in the woke church. <laughs> As stated in the previous point, the woke church is not looking to forgive its offenders. Instead, it wants to keep them in, const in a constant state of guilt and shame. That's what it is. That's what it is. Anthony Bradley here. Uh, one of the privileges of being white in America is never needing God to stop a society from trying to destroy you and your family. So the Bible is a book for evan uh, evangelicalism, disciple making, and teaching morals. Not a book for personal and social cosmic survival. So your kids, so your kids walk. <sighs> Man, oh, where we where we begin? Where we begin? So my th my thing is, man, like if it's it's no point. It's like I feel like I feel like Martin Luther King, Malcolm X went through everything they went through for nothing. I mean, he died for nothing because it, this is what we're getting at now. At the time of the, we can we're able to read 
I mean, and not just not just them. I mean, you're talking about there are white people back then too, Christian white people, who fought, who who fought and protested for the abolition of slavery, who fought for the abolition of the laws that said we can that we couldn't read or write, um, you know, all that kind of stuff like that. They did that, you know, like it's like it's like they did it for nothing, because if they could see what we're dealing with now, everything that black people are able to have been able to accomplish since then. And everything else, they were like, "Man, what are y'all complaining about? What are you, what are you complaining about? Because you don't make as much money as this person over here. Are you making more than what I would have made? Like, or, oh, because you don't get much loan. Like you, so they got a twelve thousand dollar loan, and you only can get a twelve hundred dollar loan. Okay, what was your credit like? Did you pay your bills on time? Okay, all right. What was your credit history like? Okay, all right. And what was theirs like? Oh, okay. So y'all was actually the same. So they had piss poor credit. They didn't pay their bills on time. They did this and that third. The only thing different between you two was the fact that you were white and they're black. Oh, okay. I understand. Wrong. Like, no, that's not that's not what's going on. I, I mean, I believe they were really like, hey, man, they would see they would see this as such craziness, man, if they was alive today and seeing this. They wouldn't I I don't think they would stand for this. They wouldn't stand with this. That's my personal opinion. Now Malcolm X probably would because he was on that he was on that trail. For a good minute until he until he um, was killed, he was assassinated, and, you know, by his own people. Um, needless to say, but anyway, I digress. Um, nine, the woke church movement will ultimately fail in this mission because it does not understand the law of God. And I think it's, I think a lot of people have been saying this over and over again. A. D. Robles, Brother J. Um, I think everybody who's been talking on the subject been saying the same thing. There's a misunderstanding, a misapplication of God's law in the midst of this. And this is why this is what the the ultimate divide is. In in uh, Eric Mason's book, he says that in the church is is like not uh, focusing on like justice when it comes to racial issues. We focus on justice concerning abortion and sex trafficking, but not racial issues. Um, you know, and so there comes a point where we have to we have to discuss. Okay, what is the injustices dealing with race? What is the injustices? It's systemic. I'm sorry about that. Systemic injustices, not just a one individual instance. We have a racist cop who may do something wrong, whatever the case may be. Yes, we can all agree with that. But the systemic racial injustice, where is that at? That's where it comes down to. And what we come down to is it doesn't match God's law. So follow any um, SJW on Twitter and you will quickly see that they have a disregard for the law of God. Their tweets promote favoritism toward one race, regardless of the facts. Their practical solutions to Bridging the gaps between the races are much more akin to socialism than the justice promoted in God's law. I mean, that's just self-explanatory. That's, self, that's self-explanatory. We really don't need to go deeper into that. I think we can beat the dead horse when it comes to stuff like this. It's like the only way it's going to get right if you basically just, you know, make sure I earn the same, the same amount that this person earns. And then you'll say, or then they'll say, no, that's not what we're arguing for, but yes, it is. Yes, it is. So, going on, 10. We're almost through there, guys. We're almost through. 10. The woke church movement will ultimately fail in this mission because its leaders are overly emotional, sensitive, and just plain weak. Now, here, this is the only part. <laughs> Though I understand, I've talked to Edwin about this. This is the only thing that I probably would have worded differently. And the reason why is because it hits so hard, and it's probably a good thing that it does hit hard. So, I'm not saying that I would change it. I think it's a bad way they put it. I think that when you read it, it's a shock. It's a shock value. So ultimately, when you read this point here, your 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 um your reaction is automatically offensive versus just really listening to what he means by what he's saying. And that's something I try to avoid myself. I want you to be able to hear. I want you to be able to hear what I'm trying to say without having to try to clarify myself later and all that kind of stuff like that, or to get through your emotions. Like I don't want to deal with your emotions. I want to deal with. I want to deal with the issue, the facts. But you reading this here, person gonna get emotional. First thing you get, like I'm not weak. That's the first thing I'm gonna say. I'm not weak. I'm not overly emotional and I'm not sensitive, especially about a man. The man's like, man, no, that's not me. That's not me. <laughs> it was said, lighten them up. Yeah. <laughs> and that's exactly what it is. You know, it's a it's a shock. You know, since so, so that's and that's what happened. So I got a response from this. Um, when I shared this post, uh, the guy who uh, hit me up, a, a brother in the Lord, Christian brother, the for only the main thing he brought up was this point. I'm not weak. I'm not weak. That's not me. So it's like emotions. Instead of looking at everything that's being said, automatically jumps to the fact that I'm not weak. But let's look at this again. 
The woke church movement will ultimately fail in its mission because its leaders are overly emotional, sensitive, and just plain weak. The leaders, y'all, not all y'all. I'm not talking about everybody. It's nuanced. But the leaders, the ones we, we put up as leaders of this movement, are, yeah, overly emotional, sensitive, and just plain weak. When you got people like Kyle J. Howard saying, when Dr. White invited him to meet up to have a conversation, and he says, I don't feel safe to meet with you. I don't feel safe. That's overly sensitive, and that's just plain weak. I mean, you got all this talk over the face, over Facebook and Twitter and everything else, but he invites you for a conversation, and you say, I, I don't feel safe. What is Dr. White going to do to you? What is he going to do? I mean, he can run. He's, he's a biker. He, he's pretty good in shape. So, I mean, he'd probably outrun you or something like that. Probably even beat you in a race. I said, but what are you going to do? You think he's going to attack you? Really? Really? And it's like that, that gets me back to the scripture. Aren't we supposed to hope all things concerning our brothers in the Lord? Hope all things? Like, I really don't think that of you that you would harm me physically. I can meet with you without being harmed physically or emotionally. And that's, a, you know, especially intentionally. But, yeah, that, that, that's, that's crazy. Just plain weak. Just plain weak. Eric Mason saying that. Well, people who don't, I got more, I got a lot of people telling me they agree with it and everything else. So the people who don't agree, I don't know. I don't even care. I don't want to talk to them. You know, that's weak. Because my thing is all because you got a lot of people who's yesing you, that don't mean you're right. You just got people who yesing you. Like, why not examine the arguments that people are making that's valid? You know, why not try? You know, I'm, I doubt Eric Mason will find a little old child like myself and, and want to respond to anything I got to say. But why not hear the arguments that are made? Various people, Dr. James White, the arguments he made, A, B, and C, nobody's responding to the actual arguments. They're assuming upon motives. That's what they do. Assume upon motives. And that's the overly emotional part. You get caught up in the emotion, and then you assume on motives. You doing this because you want to be super conservative. You're doing this because you want to be Republican. You do this because of your white, your white skin, and you want to you be a coon. You want to be this and that and third, Uncle Tom, and you know, all that stuff. Want to be accepted. Like, no. Why not actually... Why can't it be that we actually have valid arguments that we want to bring to the table and want you to examine honestly? Can that be the case? I would treat you with the same respect. Why not treat us the same way? And, and it's because of those things that I don't believe he's wrong in stating it like this. Because when you got people like Eric Mason saying that those who disagree, brothers, black brothers who disagree with him are angloid on the inside, and I don't see none of them coming up, oh, Eric Mason, was, that was a racist statement. No, they don't get mad when somebody says, hey, man, the leaders are, act, are overly emotional, sensitive, and just plain weak. I, if, you're not, if you're not rebuking that, don't, don't take this harsh. This ain't nothing. That ain't, that ain't as harsh as somebody saying that you are angled on the inside for disagreeing. That's an insult. That's an insult. And he hasn't repented of that. He hasn't. You know what I'm saying? So, no. Um, so, from their constant complaints of microaggressions to their ongoing plea, for the need of safe spaces. The woke church is like a middle-aged man. I found this funny. <laughs> the woke church is like a middle-aged man who still lives at home with his parents and gets upset when he is asked to clean up after himself. They, they, just, can't, they just can't seem to grow up. Now, I chuckle every time I read this. The reason why is because I just picture, I just picture, you know, I'm a big guy myself. So I just picture a guy just sitting on the couch with a, with a, um, with a tank top on, with a beer in his hand, just burping. And just sitting there watching TV, and it's like, how did you clean that up? You clean it up. I, I, I'm not cleaning up. You always get me to clean something up. I'm tired of cleaning up my mess. Like, I just picture that. And it, it, it's funny to me. So, hey, sue me. That's, I mean, that's, it's funny. <laughs> Middle-aged man, he, 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 went, he went there with the, with the description here. I, I liked it. Now, this microaggression stuff, Eric Mason said an example of a microaggression is walking into a store and the store clerk not saying anything to you. That's a microaggression. It has to be because you're black. Yep. You walked in my store. I'm, I'm an Asian owner of the store or an Asian worker or Indian worker, whatever it may be, or a white worker, and you walk in the store and I don't speak to you, then I, I mu you, it's, it's because you're black. That's why I didn't speak to you. It can't be that I had a bad day. It can't be that I just lost a loved one and I'm feeling down. I just have to be at work because I got to earn a paycheck so I can pay my bills and, it, and pay my rent and everything else. It, it can't be any of that. It has to be because you're black. You know, that's a microaggression. You know, like, no, that's, that's one, once again, just plain weak. Overly emotional, overly sensitive. Sensitive. You know what I'm saying? 
I, how many times I walked into a place and black people don't speak? I mean, I'm more, I'm more likely to go, go into a store and black people don't speak to me than it is a white person. I mean, that's just what it is. I mean, take it because I guess they're trying to be hood, whatever case may be. You say, you say, what up? And they look at you like, and you're like, okay, what up, dog? What up? Okay, I guess you don't want to speak to nobody today. All right, that's fine. <laughs> and so, <laughs> that's crazy, man. That's crazy. Oh, then the other microaggression, being followed in the story. So, you're walking around, you're trying to search for your items, and you just happen to be followed by the clerk. Or it seems to be, or it seems that you're being followed by the clerk. That's a microaggression. Because you're black, they assume you're trying to steal something. No, maybe maybe it's the fact that maybe they're trying to cancel in the aisle and you just happen to be in that way and it just seems that way, they're doing some work. Or if they are following you, give it a second, if they are walking following you, not so much because you're black, maybe because they've had some instances already where people have broken in, stolen some stuff, and they're trying to be extra careful. I mean, if I gotta if I gotta be in charge of inventory, I, well, I'm in charge of medical inventory in my area. Anybody who walks behind my counter at my job now, whether they're white or black or whatever it be, I'm following them around because I got I'm I'm accountable to this stuff. It costs some money, and if something's missing, I'm gonna be responsible. So like they coming behind my counter, like like I be I can be sitting at my desk, and they come behind my counter. Jamal, I need to grab something. I'm up and I'm with them. I'm like, okay, what you getting? Because I'm responsible. <laughs> Nathan says he gets he gets looks every time he say he's in the wrong store. He say he just chuckle. <laughs> like that's I mean it's crazy man. We all face this man, and it's for different reasons. Unless you talk to someone and get an understanding, then you can always assume that it's because of race. But nine times out of ten, it's not. All right. Then so he got Anthony Bradley got um, a quote from here on here. He said, now he's telling me to do my homework on race issues. I have four degrees, published nine books, hundreds of articles, and I'm actually black, et cetera, but not qualified. If you're in the PCA and you wonder why blacks don't stay, read Ron's tweets and look up look up this word, white explaining." All right. So I asked um, my brother Edwin about this comment because I'm, I'm not familiar with Anthony Bradley like that. So I'm like, okay, what is he talking about? Like, like who told him to do some homework? I and mean, why is he mad about doing homework? You know, but obviously... So the issue was that I guess he was he was going back and forth with somebody and they told him to do his homework on racial issues. And so now he's he's responding to that. And um and now he's going he's giving his whole accreditation. Now this goes into the emotion this goes into the overly sensitive part and the emotional part. Because you, know, you really got emotion because somebody told you to do your homework. Maybe couldn't it be that you may have said something wrong? Maybe you actually said something wrong. With your four degrees and your nine books and hundreds of articles, you may have actually said something wrong in that conversation. But it can't be that. Mm -mm. It can't be that. You can't be wrong. You got to be right. Because everybody who stands on the woke church side of things is right. And we're wrong. So, yeah, I you know, that's that. This bonus. We're going to read this bonus. Oh, we almost made it, y'all, towards the end. I've actually probably gone for straight for um, almost close to an hour. We did pretty good. The woke church movement will ultimately fail in its mission because it practically rejects the sovereignty of God. Whew. Uh, make no mistake about it. The woke church does not have a problem with the white man, but the issue is with the holy God who ordains all things to come to pass whatsoever they are. Now, unless you aren't reformed, I don't see how you have no problem with that at all. I don't understand. If you if you're if you're not if you're not reformed, unless you don't believe in predestination election, there's no reason, no reason why you should have a disagreement with that. I don't see why we have a problem. Is your voice moving better? Hey, it is. Obviously, I got my second wind. <laughs> I got my second wind. <laughs> like this is crazy. Like so, talking about oh, uh, because there's a there's somebody said this before. And they got some back. They got some backlash of it. They said that they thank God for they thank God for slavery. This was a white person. White man said he thanks God for slavery because if it wasn't for slavery, he wouldn't know his black brothers and sisters in the faith in the current church that he's in. Now, people took offense to that, and I can see on the surface of why they would take offense. But he's a reform guy. He's talking about not because racism, not not racism, not because slavery was a good thing. But because it was through the providence of God that these slaves were brought over to America and they endured the hardship they endured. And therefore, the descendants of those people end up being my black brothers and sisters who are in church today in America. You know, that's they came up later on, kiss may be. 
And so that's what he was talking about. Not that slavery was good or a good thing. You know, obviously nobody would disagree that it was bad, that it was evil. But we would have to agree if we believe what scriptures teach that God used that evil for his own purposes. And though we may not understand what those purposes were or are, that doesn't negate the fact that he did. You know, and the fact that I'm in America, I'm thankful to be in America versus in Africa right now. I mean, I'm just being honest. So, I mean, I'm not because I'm, you say, well, Jamal, because you light skin, so that's that white side of you, I guess. I don't know. I don't know what you'll say. But, I mean, that's just the truth of it. I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm thankful to be here versus overseas somewhere, you know, or in Africa in that, in that sense. So, that's it. That's, that's acknowledging God's sovereignty. God is sovereign over all things, not some things, all things, over everything, everything. Yeah, I think about um the book of Ruth. There's not a lot of Ruth that's so like dramatic, you know, like there's not fire coming down from heaven and all that kind of stuff like that. You just have like a normal everyday life going on with Ruth as she's with Naomi. But something happens. Naomi loses her sons, Ruth loses her husband. Tragedy. Tragedy. Yet it was by that that made her available to go and be redeemed by Boaz. And then, when that happens, who, let, who eventually comes through? David. And then who eventually comes through? According to the flesh, Jesus. And everything was for a purpose, but it started, that was a tragedy. She lost her husband. Naomi lost her sons. You know, it's like, I mean, we see God, he's, he uses everyday life, and he uses it for his own glory. If we can't acknowledge that, we can't deal with that, something's wrong with us. Something's wrong with us. Or we have to admit that we may not be reformed. Or we may not believe in predestination and election. Or, you know, we just don't believe the Bible in that sense. You know, we have to come to that conclusion. But I know the guys on that side don't, will not say that. They believe the Bible. They try to hold to the Bible. That's, at least that's what their intentions are. But, you know, we got to look for some consistency here. And so Anthony Bradley's quote, and we're, we're closing it up here. This is simple. Black people in America have relied on God's word to help them survive white people. Ah, man. When you're white and in the dominant culture, you've never needed the Old Testament covenant keeping redemptive God. (laughs) Oh, man. I'm not. What about, I mean, you think about, man, like, Italians. You know, you think about America when it first started. Italians weren't welcome. You know, we consider them white today. They weren't welcome. Uh, I know James White was talking about uh, his family being Scottish, like how the Scottish people were treated. Yeah, like Irish people were treated badly. Um, like, man, I, you know, I get, it just has to be black people who just needed that. What about what about Indian people? You know, like, it's just, but only if you're white, though. He, he mentioned other ethnicities. He said just white people. So if you consider white, then you never needed that redemptive God. You never needed him. You know, yours became a Christianity of moralism, and your kids walked. Oh, man, it's so racist. That's that's racist. It is, man. And that's, that's taking favoritism, partiality. Anyway, but they're not going to acknowledge that. And for those who will acknowledge that and say that, they're going to get the block button and, and be disconnected and everything else, which end up proving this article right. So you start blocking people because they agree with what's being said here, then you prove the article right, and it's true. You know? And ultimately... You, the woke church movement will fail in its mission. All right, so that's it. Exactly, exactly an hour. Exactly, exactly an hour. So that's all I got. Nothing else than that. Um, just wanted to get through that, get my review on that. Let me know what you think in the comments. I thank you for you guys, the ones who joined me on this show tonight to, um, to review this. Really appreciate you. Um, we're going to take some time in the post show, chop it up for those who are available. So the link will be, uh, well, the link will be available in a little bit. Give it some time. Stay tuned. That's for my patrons. Um, Of everyone else, I'll see you next week, Lord willing, uh, for another edition of the Prescribing Truth Podcast. Grace and peace. Prescribed truth, we giving you what the doctor ordered. Jamal Bandy, apologist, the Lord servant. We undeserving, but Christ changed our mind frame. In a world full of errors, the only thing the doctor prescribes is truth.